Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our leadership meeting tonight. Thank you for our leaders, our pastors, our overseers, and our workers and sectional leaders. We bless your name because you have kept us alive and kept us healthy and sound. And we thank you for protecting our lives so that we can continue profitably in the ministry. And we pray, Lord, that all the purpose that you have in mind preserving us, even in this difficult situation, we pray that that purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Lord, open our eyes tonight as we look at the word and the word is ingrained, inscribed in our hearts that we will do the work of the Lord more profitably in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we are coming back to the book of the Psalms. And we're looking at Psalms 14, 15, and 53 tonight. I'm sure you understand. Verse 14 is talking about the fool. Psalm 53 is talking about the fool. And as we put those together, actually those two Psalms are similar. And yet you have verse 15. And as you connect verse Psalm 14 to verse 15, you wonder, how do we approach the passage? We're ministers, we're preachers, and we have a ministry. And we have something to preach to the people we address. And as you connect Psalm 15 and Psalm 14 together, you want to prepare people for heaven. And yet it tells you that the people are foolish. There is folly in their heart. And that's the reason why we title the message tonight, The Challenging Ministry of Transforming Fools for Heaven. Uh, Psalm 15 talks about heaven and it tells us how to get to heaven. And when you look at people in general, it says they're fools in Psalm 14. And then you want to move them out of that Psalm 14 and move them to Psalm 15. That's the ministry we have, and that's the challenge before us. It says in Psalm 14 verse 1, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. That describes all men really. There is none that doeth good. That's another way of saying all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we come to Psalm 15 verse 1. In Psalm 15 verse 1, it says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy place if all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? If all are foolish and they show their folly by even denying God, who then shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? In short, if anyone gets to heaven and we know people are getting to heaven, how do we have our part in preparing people, helping people, transforming people to move out of Psalm 14 and move out of Psalm 53 and move into Psalm 15? That's what we're looking at today. We're dividing the message to three parts today. Number one, the profession of the godless fool. The profession of the godless fool. Then we go to Psalm 53, point number two. The perception of God's fathomlessness. Uh, that means uh, it's fathomless. We cannot by searching find out God altogether. He's so deep, he's so great, he's so high. And we see the perception of God's fathomlessness. And now, which we end with Psalm 15. Point number three, our preparation for the glorious future. Our preparation for the glorious future. Let's come to uh, Psalm 14 now. In Psalm 14, we're looking at the profession of the godless fool. As we look at 
at verses 1 through to 7. Number one, you see the profession of the fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Number two, you see the perversion of the fool. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Number three, you see the passivity of uh, the fool. That's in verse 2. In verse 2, it tells us about this fool. It says, the Lord looked on them from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, if there were any that see God. They are passive. They are not seeking God, the passivity of uh, the fool. Number four there in verse three. It tells us in verse three, they are all gone aside. They are all together filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. They are polluted. The pollution of the fool. And now we come to verse four. It tells us in verse four, of all the workers of iniquity, no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread. Look at this. And they call not upon the Lord. The prayer of the fool. We come to verse 5 and it tells us in verse 5, there they were in great fear for God is in the generation of the righteous. They are fearful, they are frightened, the panic of the, of the fool. And we come to verse 6, this is their practice now. It says, ye have shamed the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge, the practice of the fool. And now the last verse, which is their prevention. The Lord prevents them from crushing, from conquering, and from destroying the people of God and the nation of God. Oh, that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. Now we're going to look at three sections of this psalm. As we look at Psalm 14, we're looking at the profession of the godless fool. Point one there is the depravity and the degeneration of fools. The depravity and degeneration of fools. We're looking at Psalm 14 verse 1. It says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, in his heart, his heart is depraved. His heart is dead. His heart is deadened. His heart is in darkness and that's his depravity. They are corrupt and they have done abominable works. They have done abominable, abominable works. They are degenerate because they don't have salvation. That's why we have the degeneration. There is none that doeth good. We're looking at uh, Proverbs chapter 19 verses 2 and 3. And here we see that they do not have the knowledge of God. That's why they say there is no God. It says in Proverbs chapter 19 verse 2 also that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. That the soul be without the knowledge of God, without perception of God, it sees everything. It sees the creation of God. It cannot see God there. It sees the manifest works of God. It cannot see God there. It sees the providence of God, the provision of God. It cannot see God there. He sees God keeping him alive. Something keeps him alive. And so he came to this world. It was created by somebody, by this divine personality. And yet he cannot see God that the soul of the fool be without knowledge. It is not good. And he that hasted with his feet sinneth. Look at verse 3 that brings out it fully. It says the foolishness of man perverted his way and his heart fretted against the Lord, against the Lord. He wants to deny the existence of God. He wants to deny the presence of God. He wants to deny the power of God. Actually, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 19, Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 19, it tells us that because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. 
that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. As you look at the creation, as you look at the perfection of creation, as you look at the sun, you look at the moon, you look at the stars, you look at the arrangement, you look at this earth that is created by God, you see the proportion of the rivers of water with the land, and you see the angle, the axis, by which uh, the world, the earth is made. You see the rotation of the earth, and you see everything symmetrical, and you see everything working perfectly that which may be known of God is manifest in them. It's like uh, if you have uh, a, a car and you might not know the factory where that car was manifested for you to say there is no manufacturer while you're using the car and then how did the car come? The world as it is that we're using. We plant, it comes up, everything is okay and then the Lord is feeding us, the Lord is taking care of us and then to say there is no God what fools we are because that which may be known of God is manifesting them for God has showed each unto them look at verse 22 professing themselves to be wise they became fools they were thinking they were wise they were thinking they have knowledge they were thinking you know they are knowledgeable and yet they do not have the knowledge of their creator let's come back to that verse 20 and look at something there in verse 20 it says for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen they are clearly seen you can perceive them but these fools will not acknowledge them it says being understood by the things that are made even the eternal power of God and the Godhead so that they are without excuse the fool is without excuse. The one who says there's no God is without excuse. The one who does not have God in his thoughts, God in his plan, God in his thinking, he has no excuse. The one who acts and lives and behaves lawless and as if there's no lawgiver, as if there is no God, he says he has no excuse. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, he tells us because that when they knew God, they know there must be God. The world cannot just come out of the blue without any creator. The creation cannot be what it is without the creator because that when the new God they glorified him not as God neither was thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish look at that and their foolish depraved heart and their degenerate heart and their sinful heart and their evil heart and their uncircumcised heart and their foolish heart was darkened. That's why it says now in verse 22, it says in verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Actually, look at verse 28. And this tells you the real reason why they are what they are. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. When they think about God, they think about his person, they think about his personality, they think about his purity, they think about the punishment he could bring on them, and when they think of the punishment of their action, they prefer to block out God from their mind because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They didn't want to have the knowledge of the law of God, of the expectation of God, of the truth of God, and of the future being in the hand of God to be judged by God. Because of that, it says they did not want to retain God in their knowledge. Because of that, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Uh, let's come to number two now. It's the delusion and the destructiveness of the fool. The destructiveness and the delusion of the fools. It tells us in Psalm 14, looking at verse 1. Psalm 14, looking at verse 1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. 
because that was in the heart, and because that depravity and that delusion, and because that destructiveness is at the very fountain, the very foundation of the heart, and that, that's why they do what they do. It says they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. Those fools, the people who do not have God in their thoughts, God in their mind, God in their will, God in their action. They have done abominable things. There is none that doeth good, none of them at all. And then he tells us in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any, any, anyone that did understand and seek God. Verse 3 tells us, as God looked upon the face of the earth and upon the whole world, it says, they are all gone aside. They are all gone aside. The fool is not just uh, one person out of a thousand. The fool is not just one out of a hundred. The fool is not just one out of ten. They are all, all the people on earth, because they do not have God in their thought, God in their mind, and God in their will, and God in their action, and God in their practice. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. It tells us in verse 4, in verse 4, it says, of all the workers of iniquity, no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and they call not upon the Lord. In verse 5, it says, in verse 5, there they were in great fear. I saw they said there was no God. What are they afraid about? They knew there, they know there is God in their heart. They say, huh, this kind of life they're living, and then they block out God and they push God to the background and they relegate him to the old, old uh, time. They still have the fear that God will judge them. Yes, judgment will come. Yes, perdition will come for the people who are living, who are acting as if there were no God, for God is in the generation of the righteous. And let's look at, uh, you know, what uh, this psalm is talking about as you come to the New Testament. And it says in Romans chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 10. Romans chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written. Where is it written? That's Psalm 14. As it is written. Where is it written? In the Old Testament. As it is written. There is none righteous. No, not one. In verse 11, it continues to say, There is none that understandeth. You remember that? As we read in chapter 14 of the Psalms, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Then in verse 12, it talks about now their life. It talks about the direction of their life and eventually the destiny of their lives. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. You remember, that's exactly what we have read in Psalm 14. It says, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And then in verse 13, in verse 13 it says, their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues, they have used the seed, the poison of asps, is under their leaves. Verse 14 says, uh, verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. After all, they think there is no God. They try to convince themselves. They try to cajole themselves to say that there is no God. They try to steal their mind and deaden their conscience that there is no God because of that. Since they have already Make them make themselves to say there is no God. Their mouth now is full of cursing and bitterness. In verse 15, it tells us their feet are sweet to, to shed blood. And then in verse 16, verse 16 tells us destruction and misery are in their ways. That's why we're talking about the delusion they have and the destructiveness of the fools. 
Once somebody is deluded, once the person is thinking there is no God and he wants to feel there is no God because he feels there is no God, he says there's no judgment day. He says there is no repercussion, there's no recompense, and there is no reward for his action. Because of that, he thinks he can do anything, anything in the family or against his family, anything in the office against his profession, anything in the marketplace against uh, the good of people, anything uh, behind the door against innocent people, because after all, he's not thinking about judgment, he's not thinking about the final day, he's not thinking we will pay for everything that we have done if we don't have Christ, he's not thinking that whatever a man sows, is going to reap eventually. Because of that, destruction and misery are in their ways. In verse 17, it says in verse 17, the way of peace they have not known. Since they have blocked their mind against God, the God of peace, and the peace of God, and they have blocked their mind against the Prince of Peace, and they have blocked their mind against the Holy Spirit that brings us into the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but is the righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. But they do not want to know the Father or the Son or the Holy Ghost because of that. It says the way of peace they have not known. In verse 18, it tells us there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's why it says in their heart they say there is no God. They don't fear God. They don't think about God. They don't think that God is watching them. And God is going to look at every minute detail of their lives and that all their actions, good actions, bad actions, all their actions against God, against man, against humanity, they go into the book of records. But they don't want to think about that. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Look at the conclusion in verse 19. In verse 19 it says, Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. All the world becomes guilty before God. Look at the conclusion now in verse 23. In verse 23, it tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If man remains in that state of folly, in that state of foolishness, if man remains with that mind and that heart and that disposition and that depravity of foolishness of the fool until he dies, what happens? The destiny and the damnation of fools. Number three, in this section now, the destiny and the damnation of fools. Let's look at Second Samuel chapter 3 and verse 33. Second Samuel Chapter 3, verse 33, the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth. Think about that. Died Abner as a fool dieth. Everyone that lives like a fool will die like a fool. Everyone that thinks like a fool will die like a fool. Everyone that abandons God. Everyone that will not have God in his thoughts and God in his mind and he lives and he practices fully and he practices foolishness until the last day, until the final day, he dies like a fool. His nature is the nature of a fool. His practice is the practice of a fool. His actions are the actions of a fool. And his way of thinking, his way of planning, every step he takes against God, 
against the watch of God and against Christ, the anointed one of God, and against the Holy Ghost, the third personality in the Holy Ghost, and against the revelation of the word of God. Everything he does, he does deliberately against the God of heaven. For Samuel chapter 25, verse 25. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, reading from verse 25, it's talking about the nature of the fool. It says, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belium, even neighbor. For as his name, so is he. As his name is, so is he. As his name is, so is his nature. As his name is, so is his uh, character. As his name is, so is his disposition. As his name is, so is the action of his life. As his name is, so is he. Neighbor is, is his name. And fully is in him. And fully is with him. And fully abides with him. Let's look at this man and look at his son. Look at verse 37. In verse 37, it says, But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife told him these things, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him.